you're right, tech companies are getting away with a lot. This has become like just the snake that eats itself. When we play a gig, people say, you don't have to get paid because it's to promote the record. Now, after piracy and everything, people say, well, the actual record is promotion for your tours. That doesn't work. So then it's like, sync is the one thing that we always kind of hung on to, as we just said. If we get the sync company saying, well, it's promotion for your record. That would be like saying that actors shouldn't get paid because look, they're on TV for an hour. Look what great promotion that is. Hey, what's going on? Welcome to the McCove Mindset Podcast. This week, we're going to sit down with my friend, Helianne Linval. She's an award-winning songwriter, musician, and she writes for publications like The Guardian. She's currently the head of business relations at Audley, which is a music rights management platform. And as a songwriter, she has worked with some of the biggest songwriters in the world, working with artists that have worked with Kelly Clarkson, Britney Spears, Kenny Chesney, Carrie Underwood, the Backstreet Boys, Mark Anthony, among others. This woman is such an advocate and champion for creators' rights. I am really looking forward to bringing you this episode. And as always, if you like what you hear, hit like, leave a comment, and subscribe. Let's get to it. Welcome to the McCove Mindset Podcast. Thank you. Lovely yeah, no, to be I really here. Appreciate, I appreciate you being here. I'm taking the time out of your day. You know, I wanted to have you on because you're such an advocate for the business side of music. And also, like, you know, fighting for songwriter rights. Um, how did you, like... How did you get into that space? I've had I had a few records out. Now, when I think back, I had a few records out when I was a teenager in Sweden. I was a featured singer on a record in in New York that did quite well. Did a lot of got a lot of airplay on like uh, Hot ninety seven, and I performed. At, what was like, the record? So. It was called Let the World Dance. It, it was um, it was called BC Underground, the, uh, the act. It was somebody from Brass Construction, Randy Muller. The thing is that when I think about it, I, I don't even know what I get paid, got paid for that. You know, I probably got paid like a, a few hundred, which I probably thought was really good when I'm like 20 years old for like a, a, an afternoon in the studio. And that's all. And I, I found it on like the streaming services and my name is like nowhere <laughs> to be found oh wow it. they didn't credit you um no i mean wow. nothing against randy i don't know i mean i've met randy since and i you know it, it is what it is but but um it, it just goes to show like back in the you know how how all those indie records like the credits there's just no kind of i don't i don't even know under what kind of uh even the, the songs that I had out as a teenager, I wouldn't even know where to look now. I mean, the only reason I found this was because I right. found it on on YouTube first. And then, because uh, YouTube is like the best search engine ever. Not, they don't pay anything, but it's a, a good search engine because they have all music. You know, whether it's been released or not, you can probably find it if you know what to look for. I didn't know anything about these things. When I got my first publishing deal, I thought, great, I can make money, like, I, or I could, you know, they'll take care of all that stuff. I'll just make music, and you know, the royalties will be coming in. Uh, the whole thing of like discussing splits, like nobody wants to do that because you know it feels like giving somebody a prenup on your first date or something. So, I you just assume that it's going to be split equally, which you know, down the line, you realize not everybody have the same assumptions um you definitely don't collect people's ipi numbers or their you know anything like that um you you know th there's so many things that you don't know about and actually i got signed before streaming so when streaming came along and suddenly like well first we had piracy and then we had like downloads and then we had streaming and i actually at that point i'd been signed to a couple of major uh, publishers 
And I thought I could kind of see it was before streaming that I wanted to kind of like do something else uh, at the same time. And I, I got a uh, column for The Guardian uh, called Behind the Music that I would do like a weekly column for them talking about what it's like being a music uh, creator. Um, kind of initially I was talking a lot about piracy and like what we actually make, what, what songwriters make versus artists and how we... Uh, we don't make money. We can't like, you know, uh, make money from merchandise and all those things. Um, so actually the music is what we make money from. So when people say, oh, you know, you don't have to get paid for the music, you can tour and that, that's going to kind of pay you everything that obviously doesn't work. It doesn't even work for artists. But um, at that point, you know, I, I remember at The Guardian, they didn't even know like what they asked me what publishing was if I could like explain that in a in an article uh, like with one or two sentences um, and I realized that actually they didn't know that there was like two copyrights to to a song um, I mean they're, they've gotten a lot better now I think but um, it just kind of showed that a lot of the mainstream people in in you know in of the public don't don't know that always that that artists don't always write their own songs that um, right. there's this whole kind of village it takes to make a record um so i wrote a lot of things for them and because it, it was there were so few um kind of uh, columns in in national newspapers that actually would talk about these things so suddenly i got all these organizations, like the BPI, which is like the RIA of, of the UK, they reach out to me. The Musicians Union would reach out to me. Like PRS reached out to me. They, everybody wanted me to write about, you know, what what was going on in their particular field. And that's when I learned, started, you know, learning what was actually going on and, and um, all the kind of inequities and then look, started looking at my own royalty statement. <laughs> I kind of realized, wow, you know, it's like streaming is not uh, is not going to pay my rent. And I think through right. that, I then got involved with uh, the British Academy of Songwriters and Composers, um, which is, uh, I guess, the, the it's like the music creators of North America, the MCNA or something like that. You know, there's a few in the US, there's a few different organizations. So um, I get involved with that and, and then I get more and more kind of active. And now, no, I'm the, uh, uh, sorry, I didn't like read mine. Um, and now um, I'm involved in uh, the European Composer and Songwriter Alliance. So that's how I, and now I'm, the president of the European Composer and Songwriter Alliance. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. What are the top three things that songwriters need to know to try to generate an income for themselves? Well, the first thing that they need to know is that they need to join a PRO, obviously. I think that's like the basic thing. Not everybody right. does, and artists need to do that as well. Um, you need to make sure that you register all your songs as quickly as I, and and have have those you know uncomfortable split discussions as early as possible. If you're in the studio with somebody, usually it's very simple. You you know, to me, it's like you just split it equally. You know, what, whatever. The, right. It makes everything so much easier when you're just like, yeah, it's down the middle. Yeah, exactly. Or or if it's three people, you know, three ways. And uh, it's, it's when it gets complicated is when I work quite a lot in dance music. So we're, sometimes we're not ever in the same studio. I have records out with people that I've never met. Uh, actually, in dance music, that's quite common. Uh, right. so then it could, and then what happens then sometimes it's like people get added after you've written the song and then splits get distributed, uh, along the way. 
So uh, you have to have uncomfortable uh, conversations at that point sometimes. So, um, but those things, because if you don't agree on the splits, then nobody's going to get paid. Right. And then number three. And number three is that you need to get into sync, because then <laughs> otherwise you're never going to make a living. No. But, um, uh, I think that the I'm thing laughing is, at this. I'm laughing at this for a lot of different reasons. But yes, like... you know, right. That's well, you know, I'm right. <laughs> course you know but um uh, i think yeah. everybody you, if, you, if you ask any songwriter who works in popular music they will say like if they recouped their uh, advances from a publisher um that is because they had some really good syncs so why do you think i agree with you and thank you for those three I, I definitely agree that those are super important. I, I want to pivot a little bit and, and kind of go off Actually, what you can I, just can I, said. Can I do a bonus? Yeah. Because this is one that I, I and I, I say this to artists and songwriters, and any time that I do a masterclass, I always include this one. Um, and it's about how publishing and record deals work. Because a lot of people don't realize that you get recouped from your share. So the recoupment doesn't come from 100%. It comes from whatever is your share. So if you have a record deal and you're on 20%, old school 20%, then that means even if you're not recouped, that doesn't mean that the label hasn't made a profit. Actually, by right. the time you're recouped, the label will have made a profit five times over. So I think that's one of the things that hardly any artists understand like when they first sign and and for songwriters it's the same thing obviously but songwriters used to usually get 50 percent or more at least um on on the publishing side so for for you what has been what has been your experience like with dance music with songwriting with getting stuff for sync like What's, what has been the thing that you're like, yes, this is what has allowed me to continue to write music outside of like publishing deals and stuff? Um, well, it's like you have to these days. I mean, in the beginning, actually, I, you know, I was able to, uh, with advances and, and when physical was still quite big then I, w I was able to survive just on, on that. But I think today um, you need to be, uh, you know, multi-talented and, and, and uh, think of a lot of different ways of, of uh, making, uh, making money. Obviously, as I said, sync and, and publishing, uh, sync and, and regular cuts. Um, I would say uh, vocal production, which is, you know, to actually, um, I realize that I've done production like all the time through the years, but I never actually claimed production. And uh, I think that that is important. I think a lot of, in particular, women tend to not kind of uh, stand in that and, and claim that. Um, I would say we had a, uh, a campaign here in in the UK uh, called Pay Songwriters. Actually, it was international. We we did it across Europe and even with American writers. We had some really big writers sign up to it, uh, including Ross Golan and Sona and the Hundred Percenters and uh, Rick Knowles. Andrew Lloyd Webber even signed up to it. Not that he would need it, but um, it was uh, <laughs> part of what we. What we wanted was um, points on the master, and this is something that we um, we're really pushing for now because because the songwriter uh, revenue is so low. Um, it's uh, fifteen percent. Just for for those who don't know, like if you have a pie of the royalty pie, thirty percent goes to the DSPs, the the service. 55% uh, goes to the label 
and 15% is being split between the songwriters. So, um, and also to ask for a per diem to, to kind of cover expenses um, when you work with artists. Because a lot of the time you, you can kind of develop artists. So uh, that in itself, you know, you just need to kind of make sure that you don't lose money by, by doing that. So how do, like, because I think that that's a great point. I, I doubt that many songwriters are even thinking about that. They're, they're still trying to figure out how to get paid to write a song for someone. You know, so like, you know, if we take, because I want to make sure that we accommodate different musicians who are at different stages in their careers. Mm -hmm. And if you're at a stage in your career where, you know, you don't have a publishing deal, you're not working with a label, you're not working with a signed artist, um, you're, you're an independent and you're working with independent artists. How do you go about having a conversation with someone who's never really paid a songwriter per se, right? To be like, hey, you have to pay me for my music. Well, I think that it's it's uh, it it all depends on like what you see in that artist as well. Like, if it's an artist that you feel like that you feel has potential, you can do a production deal um, where. You know, you will be traveling together trying to, you know, get a record deal. And you will, you know, if that artist gets a record deal, you would be benefit from that as well. Um, if it's somebody that would not be somebody that you want to make that journey with, then um, I think, it, you know, you should definitely be able to, to charge for it. I mean, there are plenty of platforms where people go... Uh, to to kind of get a production, get somebody to like lay a guitar, get somebody to write a song with them. Um, I think you know. I that, think that that's so much more. And uh, not to cut you off, it, to kind of yeah. add to what you're saying, I I think that it's so much more culturally accepted, at least here in the states, to pay someone to play on your record to pay someone for production. Even producers find it really hard to get paid. Um, mm -hmm. But I think those things are more like accepted. Paying a songwriter to write you a song, I feel like that's a much more difficult hurdle because most artists who are independent write their own songs. So the concept of someone else coming in and writing a song for them, it's more like, well, you wrote a song for me. So, you know, it's like a <laughs> gift. Yeah. But, but that's why no but that's why a lot of uh artists don't in the end are they're not successful because mm. they uh don't get that input from somebody else and i think this is a thing if you think about it um and i agree with you it's i, I mean it it is I think the, the artists that realize their that how much they can up their game by having somebody that has um, songwriting experience and uh, I mean the song is everything. Well, I would say so, but you know, production and everything is, is is important. But if you don't have a great song, you have nothing. Then you just you know, I mean. Now I'm going to do like a real kind of name drop, but um, I when I talked to Quincy Jones, <laughs> I was, I'm, I'm ready to yeah, like, Low-key, you yeah, know, low we were just hanging out, me and Quincy. <laughs> yeah, like. I was at a, actually, and now it's even more, it was like the, the, the pre-party for when Max Martin was winning his Polar Music Prize, and I was working on a project with him. And... Um, uh, so Quincy Jones was there in, at this kind of party in Stockholm and uh, he he asked me what I did for a living and when I said I was a songwriter he said oh, see it's all about the song he said you can have an average singer sing a great song and it'll be a hit but you can't have a great singer sing an average song and it becoming a hit And, you know, those are wise I think, words. You know, he he's got some experience, but um, I think this is a thing. I mean, if you if you look at him, for example, and and 
Rod Temperton, who wrote a lot of the stuff that he worked on, not just the Michael Jackson thriller stuff, but even Quincy Jones's own stuff. And um, it was just, you know, it was the song, obviously a production, but you had to have the song at, at the core. And for so how any do you convince artist, someone not, of that? Sorry? How do you convince someone of that? Like, when when you were trying to get your first cuts... You know, before it was a little, I'm not going to say easier. I don't want to say it like that. But, you know, before you have something underneath your belt to point to, Mm -hmm. to help you to sell yourself as a writer, when you don't have any of those things, how do you go about selling yourself as a writer? Well, I, I always say that your music is your business card. So you need to work on your, your songs. You have to invest in making good recordings and uh be and have maybe you need to do some co-writing too if you're if you're if you want to work as a writer i mean i when i started out i never i'd never co-written really um and now i love co-writing i think that's you know much more fun than writing on my own and i think um a lot of the time, you know, if you if you get like a good, good um, kind of a, a good collaboration, a good vibe, there's nothing better, and and the songs become better that way. But I think if you're starting out, work with as many people as possible, because a lot of the time you don't know with every person you work with, you're expanding your network. Co-write with as many people as you can, because. There's like, there, there'll be people that you work with. Like I worked with, and granted, we were both assigned to, to a publisher at the time, but one of the writers that I worked with uh, ended up working on some of the biggest records, you know, that that uh, that are around, and he's become like the coolest writer ever. But when we were working together, we were all, we had just both, we, we were starting out and was we're just kind of, playing around and, and growing together. So I so. totally, I agree with all of that. The, when I was younger, earlier in my career, uh, 2012, I think I have the receipts. I got the emails. <laughs> like, you know, like 2012, I think it was, um, we were working with, a writer, her name is Brittany Hazard, and she goes by the name Stara now, and she's one of the biggest songwriters in the world. Mm. And it's crazy to think, like, wow, we were writing songs together 10 years ago, you know, and, and you just never know. It was like, oh, yeah, this is just another person who works at a regular job, who goes to school like me, like, you know, it's just like everything... And then as you get, as it's crazy because like, as people grow their careers, like they're really dedicated to it and they grow, you end up having a line of communication with someone that is in a completely different place than like when you first work with them. And it's not like that's the reason why you should, but I think it's a byproduct. You know, I think that it is a byproduct of just like building good relationships across the board. Because eventually you're all going to move towards a positive direction anyway. The same thing happened with Jimmy Allen. That's how I got to really open for him is I was a teenager and we were performing at like the same talent show. Mm -hmm. And he was like, he's a couple years older than me. I was still in high school. We performed at the same talent show. He had just like done a show at uh, the Apollo and fast forward over a decade later and through still keeping communications here and there and checking in and you know because before he blew up there was a long stretch of what we all go through trying Mm -hmm. to you know get on trying to build a career and just like checking in on somebody and being like hey you know hope that you're doing well see that you got a new group or a new band or whatever that last song that you did is cool and keeping that thread of communication now it's like okay cool he won cma artist of the year and it's like hey like i'm doing a show in the area open you know it's it's crazy how that can really work out for you 
And being a nice person, you kind of touch on something there. It's like, I always think, for example, if you would be opening for somebody on tour or something, people want to have people around who are nice to be around. And then that goes for you, for anybody as a co-writer as well. You know, if people want to be around people who are nice, good, encouraging people. So that's, if you're a writer, always keep that in mind. I got a, a really good story that is kind of uh, relates to what you were, were just saying, where um, a, a, a publisher I know in Sweden, um, at Universal, um, he was telling me the story about one, the Swedish artist who um, she had just been signed to a big record deal. This was like, I think some somewhere in like the late 90s or something like that. No, probably earlier. And um, she was working with Max Martin before Max Martin like blew up. I mean, he I think Max Martin had already worked with like Dennis Pop, but he wasn't like, you know. A, so we're talking like uh, 80s Max Martin. But no, I mean like early 90s. Like, you know, okay. they, yeah. And... Uh, so it was probably early mid nineties cause he didn't do it. He really blew up with Backstreet Boys. Backstreet Boys. Uh, yeah. yeah. So this was before Backstreet, right. You know, not that, that, uh, long before Backstreet Boys. And, uh, and then he got Britney after that or around that time. And then that kind of rolled on. But, um, so at the time he was working with her and they were started working together and it, what didn't work that well somehow you know she did a record but she didn't use the song that they had written because their collaboration didn't work that well fast forward a few years later and he's just kind of like blown up with with Backstreet Boys and uh this is what the Universal Publisher is telling me so so he says apparently Max went back and kind of because he was so successful that you know he he could almost he he didn't have time to like write as much as as you know the demand uh, for songs. So he went through some old songs that he hadn't finished, and he took the song that they had written together, her and him, and he sh changed it a bit. So instead of getting a fifty-fifty, I think she got like a third of it or something, and um, it turned out to be "Shape of My Heart" for Backstreet Boys. Oh wow. And that, and she was, by the time that came out, um, she, her career had kind of like, wasn't a, doing as, as uh, well as kind of had been expected. And she got that, I think her, her, it recouped her publishing deal and got her another publishing deal, like for another, you know, mill or something. Cause that, wow. that was one of the biggest records. And that was a song that they That's had, you know, like, that hadn't, you know, so this is a thing too, is like, you never know where those songs are going to end up. Right. You know. That's really cool. It's a great, That's it's a really great cool. story. And it's a, you know, uh, you just never know. It, it was a good song. It just needed some tweaking and it needed Backstreet Boys to sing it. <laughs> I get right, it. so it needs an opportunity. I think that that's a good, you know, a good point is that your songs need an opportunity, and then what you do with those opportunities can really have a, a deep impact on what happens with your career. Mm -hmm. And that's going to lead me to a segue, <laughs> which is that this podcast, you know, is sponsored by Joy Burst, this this energy drink company, right? And the Joy Burst talent search is going on right now. So the Joy Burst talent search is a talent search that. Right now, it's it's running. It's running from February 15th to March 15th. And then there's a voting period from March 15th until the end of March. And the grand prize is a $10,000 cash prize and a song publishing deal. And this being involved with this project, with this campaign and with this company, all came out of a song. This came out of writing a song for a brand and that brand liking the song, taking the song, bringing on Vanilla Ice to record the song, that song then going out and being kind of like toured on the I Love the 90s tour, which brought in, you know, like some more work and brought this opportunity to work on this particular campaign in which it was like, okay, cool. Maybe there's a way to bridge some other things. 
and none of that would have happened without a song. And so when you said in your top three things with the bonus extra four that sync is important, I'm like, yeah, there's actually a really remarkable kind of thing that you can do with sync that goes beyond an upfront payment. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you think of, like, right now, um, Love Island, I mean, I don't know how big Love Island is in the States, but it's huge Everyone is talking about this show. Yeah, right. Like, so I don't know about it like that. It's been going for years here. And uh, if you get a song on Love Island, then that, it it has such a, because it, it has such a huge audience and... The, the songs play such a kind of, you know, intricate. It's like you watch a movie, though it's a, a, a reality show. So you can, by having a song there, that could kind of feed into you going into the charts as well. Um, and they don't necessarily have to have new songs. They can have old songs and all sorts of... It could be covers sometimes. Um, but it's really... Um, uh, really useful and of course then we got tiktok speaking of that which should be a sync but we don't get paid like a sync oh please 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 give me the sauce on this because i was in i was playing spectator mode in our group chat and when you started going ham i was like oh hellian is pissed <laughs> like she is not happy about this tiktok thing so for the audience who obviously doesn't have access to our chats, <laughs> but talk about the dilemma that's going on right now. I think which the song you referenced was the uh, Toxic Pony remix. Yeah. yeah. I'm all ears. Half a billion streams. Half a billion streams. I looked it up on, so, so that, you know, online, but maybe, so, so that doesn't mean anything with TikTok. You know, it, it, um, you don't get paid per stream. Uh, you, you get paid per how many people create a video of it. Um, and because it's such a wild west with TikTok now, um, that people upload things and they put their names on it. So how the people who actually wrote the song are going to be traced or, or, uh, in any way compensated is completely random. Um, I think, you know, a lot of the, the, a lot of the publishers have done deals that are lump sum anyway. So, you know, the, the, the interest of kind of tracing and paying the right people in that, it might not be a priority for, for uh, some of these publishers. Um, And on top of that, it's like that, that particular song, the reason I was also kind of uh, talking about it was like nobody had asked any of the writers. I mean, Toxic and Pony, huge songs. You know, yeah. Timbaland, I know for, you know, I'm pretty sure that Timbaland would not go for like a straight kind of like even split for anything that came out that way. Um, right. And, you know, I know Kathy Dennis who wrote Toxic, she'd probably want to have a, a or she co-wrote Toxic with some other people. She probably would, would like to have a, a conversation as well about it. But because everything just get gets kind of uploaded and then goes viral. Um, and actually with that particular song, it was released on Spotify as well. And from what I understand, the writers were not necessarily um, um, asked about that either. So it, Okay, it, so hold on. So let me let me just pause so I can catch up. Or follow along. So what we're saying is that Genuine's Pony and Britney Spears' Toxic, there's a song on TikTok that is a remix of like these songs that was created by a different producer or DJ or someone. And then this song proceeded to get reshared and went viral on like videos all over the place. The sound got shared and it acquired over like half a billion streams. And then that song... This, this remix was then uploaded to Spotify, put on Spotify where it received its own streams and none of the writers had got asked permission and none of the writers got paid. There's like no license. It's just there and someone else who uploaded it is making all of the money off of someone else's work. As far as I understand, yes. Dang. 
<laughs> like that is that is so crazy. That is the craziest thing ever. Just because, like, I mean, we, you know, I I understand this, but I'm also coming from it from the mindset of like, you know, if if you're a listener and you're listening, to really put that into the scope of how many people are involved with the music that you love and the music that you enjoy. And if you're an independent writer or artist that this could potentially happen to you. Yeah. Really from the writer side. Cause I guess from the artist side, it's like, if your name goes out there, you, you know, it can go viral. And then there's probably a way for you to make, like you can create value out of that if you're tactful. But from the writer side of things, you're just kind of getting screwed. Yeah, and you're not, and God knows you're not even getting credited, you know. So, uh, I mean, wow. I don't, you know, I, you know, you, it, it's, it's, it's one of these things where I think, you know, the industry will catch up with it sooner or later, like TikTok is such a I feel like in a way people always say that oh it's like you know what we did what MTV did before like you know MTV didn't have to pay for music because everybody said it was promotional and then you realize that oh so they built a whole industry like a whole business on the back of of music creators without without paying um Obviously, in I know in the U.S. the artists don't get paid for radio play. Everywhere else in the world, they they do. So uh, that's you know in itself um, crazy to to all of us right. over here. But I think also it's the thing of uh, because when we're talking about TikTok, it's almost like you know that it can even like lead into AI and all these things where where. Um, the the people who created the music don't get credited so you don't even when people say oh well you know you don't get paid but it's promotion but it's not even promotion if you're not even linked up with it and right. i think people sometimes sometimes the argument will go well you know that it's not like taylor swift is is you know starving or but obviously we've got this whole middle class and even the, the ones that are trying to kind of um, move up that are not Taylor Swift. And and for all the music creators, could you imagine like if you're a new music creator, somebody takes your work and kind of releases it, release it. I mean, with, with Pony and Toxic in the end, like it could go to, to a lawsuit, but they wouldn't make any much money anyway because i just looked it up and they're actually credited because i was so curious after you said oh, that they I are, it up. Yeah. but they can be they can be, and, and maybe that was retroactive they yeah and they can be credited without actually a split having been worked out as well um right of course you know it's like somebody has just taken oh these are the writers of, of each song but um and then put it in yep yeah or you know i mean the thing is uh yeah, they that has probably that has probably happened in in retrospect because I know people involved in that that were surprised. That were surprised by right. by uh, uh, the whole thing, but but I think you know it's it's you know it's like a couple of things with TikTok. One is is the thing of of the way that they've decided they're gonna pay, um, which is bullshit. Uh, in my book, you know, it's like, how have scary. they decided that they're going to pay? Because they're TikTok, they're Chinese, they're uh, nothing against like, well, you know, they, they've basically just dictated along with the labels initially, I guess, I guess the labels have said, um, that, you know, for now pay us a lump sum. So they've been paid something up front to get access, uh, to not get sued for using the, the catalog. But, um, right. So I, I would like assume, I mean, license. we don't, you know, I mean, it's, it's covered by non-disclosure agreements, but, um, it's basically, it's the similar thing to what YouTube did in the beginning, where it's like, we're going to use your music. Uh, so either we do a, an agreement 
and you get something or you're not going to get anything. Or as I've now kind of done a trial in, in Australia where they say, okay, well, we're going to use music, but people are not going to be able to use your music because you're playing hardball. So universal artists are not going to you know, feature or Sony artists or whatever the label is that it is, is saying no. And, and the argument that they say then, see, it is promotional, but just because something is promotional doesn't mean that it shouldn't be paid for. Right. I think the, the, uh, Every usage is the end game in the end. If somebody is building a business on the back of your work, then you need to be compensated. You know, you need to get a share of that. I, I That's such a big thing in sync too. You know, yeah. like like type types of usage. You know, because when you use the word like usage, right? Like that's that's one it's of those so, words that can Right. It covers so much, so many different things. Right. And so, you know, on, on TikTok, for instance, it's like, look, you can have your music. It maybe you got, it got there. Let's say you're an independent, you use DistroKid or TuneCore or something like that. CD Baby, you uploaded your music. You've clicked the boxes that allow it to be on TikTok. It's there for usage. Right. But so that usage is different than commercial usage. You have to allow for commercial usage if you want to be able to run an advertisement off of the back of that song. So if you want to take the sound, upload it into the video, that's fine. It can be distributed. It can go viral. But if you want mm. to then put paid promotion behind it, well, that's a different kind of usage. So it has yeah. to be cleared for that usage. And it's the same thing in like TV advertising stuff where it's like, well, is this, are you licensing it for digital? Are you licensing it for broadcast? Is are you know, and sometimes it's like there's sometimes they have to pay for each type of usage. If it's like, okay, well, you, this is a 15 second spot, that's one particular kind of usage. If you create a 30 second spot, that's another kind of usage. And if you have a, a minute spot, that's a different kind of usage. And you need to pay for all three of those things. And then is it going to be formatted to go onto a different type of platform? So if it was for digital, but then you decide that you want to run a radio ad or promotion, well, now we've entered into broadcast. And like, you know, okay, is it going to go to TV? Okay, that's that's different. And there's different rates and things that, you know, are kind of worked out for that. Usage can be, a, you know, a, a very broad, broad term. And I think that you're right. Tech companies are getting away with a lot of yeah, usage. Yeah. I think that the because most of those rules that you're talking about are worked out for television, for network television initially. And mm -hmm. so much that happens online is being um, treated like it's a, in a whole different world with a whole, you know, different, you know, type of, of rules, which really it shouldn't be. And... I mean, to, to, to bring back the, the promotional, go back to the promotional argument, I remember, uh, I actually wrote an article about it when I was writing my column for The Guardian because it really pissed me off. There was a, a, the music supervisor for Glee, and he had done a, a, a presentation for independent labels, they, or like he was on panel, and they were talking about it. And obviously people wanted to be on Glee. It, it had a lot of... Um, power to kind of break songs and, and artists and and he said um you know i don't understand why we still have to pay for music to use music because it's such a you know it's such great promotion and i wrote an article that kind of said well this has become like just the the snake that eats itself so when we play a gig People say, "Oh, the, you should. You don't have to get paid because it's to promote the record." Now, after piracy and everything, people say, "Well, the actual record is promotion for your tours." So that doesn't work. So then it's like, "Okay, well, um, maybe your uh, the sync sync is the one thing that we we have always kind of hung on to, as we just said, you know." And then if we get the sync company saying, well, it's promotion for your record. 
then right. where is that? It's all promotion. And, and I said, that would be like saying that actors shouldn't get paid. Because look, they're on TV for an hour. Look what great promotion that is. Maybe they can do some advertising for some beer. Right. Like what, what other job would that kind of... Uh, <laughs> would they not get paid because they, you know, when they're actually doing yeah. a job, it's a, it's a, it's a funny old thing. <laughs> it's a conundrum. It's, it's, it's a conundrum because it's like, allow me to play devil's advocate a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like, because there is, there are a lot of things that you can pivot from in today's market and accessibility is just there you know it's everything is accessible for the mm -hmm. most part right now and you can kind of work yourself into to reasonable positions i think with tech companies they're just in front like they're, they're in front of things you know when when tv the rates are worked out in like broadcast and radio and tv and stuff because like it well it took time to get there mm -hmm. in tech it's developing so fast. It's continuing to like kind of grow and evolve so quickly that it's like, well, we will get there, but never before have you been able to like reach so many people. There's no real limitation. You're not limited by radio waves. You're not limited by like, oh, well, this person is subscribed on like this channel. So like, the internet is open for everybody. Mm -hmm. And that really, really changes kind of like the market i think that advertising companies are really understanding this that it's like mm -hmm. you know we have access to a global economy and in the global economy you can just there are so many more people to sell to there's like more and more people coming onto the internet every day almost like as an artist where it's like oh how do i you know make sure that i have a thousand fans or 500 fans it's like look if if you can if you can get reach, which is essentially what the tech companies are selling, right? As access to a pool of people that give you reach, you could recycle a thousand people a day until the end of your life. And you wouldn't even scratch the surface of the population that is out here that is actually a population that can pay. Mm -hmm. And if you can get them to pay for something else, right? Like what else do people really truly make outside of a version of content? Let's for, let's say that music is a version of that content that can serve as that powerful of a magnet to bring that much attention to you. And you can sell something else. You know, like I, I see that. I see that argument. I really do. But that, but Unfortunately, I think that it cuts a lot of people out, though. Yeah, well, I mean, you think of all all the artists that are not, you know, the the sellable. I think that with that, you then, if you think of as a music lover, um, you are painting yourself into like, do you, you know, the the as the saying goes, if you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. Like, you know, if you uh don't if you don't pay then you are going to get a different kind of you're not going to get an artist that has the freedom to just create you will get an artist that is creating to cater to like uh not just an audience but to um an advertising community or whatever so which is what we see with a lot of the influencers, you know, it's. So it's can I, kind of, will it's you let me play devil's thing. advocate some more? Yeah. Okay. And thank you for allowing me to mm -hmm. just no, make the I, conversation I like, you know, interesting. I, I like being challenged. Um, well, it's not necessarily that I think this way at all. I, you know, I just, uh, I like to add perspective. Mm -hmm. What, do you enjoy do you enjoy Mozart? Uh yeah. You think it's like good music. Would you say that the impact that Mozart has had on the world and music and, you know, the genre of his time that that's a positive impact? Yeah. 
that music was created for a very specific pers- purpose and virtually person, like entity. Let's it, Our yeah. version of the church now is like advertising agents or agencies. Our version of the king, right? And that was the only person who was like the patron of music that got anywhere. Yeah. And we find real value and we hold it to esteem. Can you see the parallel? I no, I understand what you're saying. And and it's a similar argument as um uh, you know, artists create the 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 best when they're poor or when they're you know, I mean it's it's so many, you know, all of these things where okay, you can't uh you know it's almost like artists would create whether they you know, whether they make money or not, it's, you know, for him, actually, it was created for that, but he actually, you know, if you, if, well, obviously all we got, we don't, we, we just know the movie and the book, you know, Amadeus. <laughs> Amadeus. Yeah, so we right. You know, we're, we're basing it on, on, you know, something that is half fiction. But, um, I, I think that about when it comes about, variety and diversity and and when it comes to uh i mean i I will take like a counter argument in the sense of there's a uh uh god what's his name kip kip moore uh, a, a nashville artist and there was a an article in, in billboard about where he was being interviewed and he said when he goes on tour he will pay um uh, thousands of dollars to all the writers that contributed to his album, whether he plays those songs or not on his tour. Because the way that he sees it is if it wasn't for the record, then people wouldn't come to, to or his, reco- his records, people wouldn't come to his gigs. Um, and he says there are a couple of different reasons for it. It's that because he thinks it's fair. It's also because he has seen as we've all seen in the in certainly in, in popular music that it is so difficult to make a living from writing um, popular music or writing music for for artists as a songwriter that everyone is only out to make a single because an album track you know you're gonna make maybe thirty pounds if you make it enough to kind of cover your train fare or whatever else you, you spent that day, then you're lucky for an album. You're good. Right. Everybody want, needs to have a single and a single that is promoted. So it means, and this is what, what Kip Moore was saying, that he, he had seen how more and more writers would come in and they were, they would be risk averse. They would be less um, keen to kind of, uh, experiment um, because if it wasn't a single then that day would actually have cost them money so for him he wanted them to feel comfortable enough to um, write something you know that that was unexpected and and right, if I you know bad. also as a as a a kind of a counter uh, argument to what you you just said too is uh, you know I I was um, talking to Martin Mills who's um, the head of Beggars Group which is an independent label group and he was saying you know I don't want to give people what they want I want to give people what they don't yet know they want and right. and he kind of used art the artists like Nirvana you know or the sex pistols or, you know, people who have changed the, the landscape of music, they did something that was not like what had been done before. And you kind of need that, you know, uh, if you want the art to develop, if you want it to grow, if you want it to evolve, yeah, you need people to be able to experiment, you know? And I think that, you know, cause that like, that connects to this other thing that we have going on because of technology, right? Which is like, there's sort of a uniformity of sound, right? 
it, we have a democratization of the ability to listen to all kinds of music and there's all kinds of influences and now you know there's less like this music belongs to this region it's more like well because everybody gets to hear it and those mm. influences kind of come in and it starts to congeal so on the streaming platforms you have a real push for the most part for the top playlist i'm not saying this is across the whole thing but for the top playlist virtually the stuff that's on there are hits right the singles mm -hmm. that you were talking about so what it did was it took a demand for songwriters and it said all the songwriters have to be hit writers but not all songwriters are hit writers you know, I would argue <laughs> that, like, I'm, that's not me. Like, I'm not a hit writer, at least yet, right? Like, I've never written one, so I can confidently say I'm not a hit songwriter, right? But that doesn't mean that there's not a space for you. There just may not be a space for you that does really well in that particular environment. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why I got into sync is because it's like, yeah, back in the day when there was, like, albums... You'd have a writer and maybe they wrote like, let's say it's a 13 track album and they wrote track 13 and the purpose of track 13 is not the same purpose as like track one or like track three, mm. you know, so, oh, it's got to close the album and the album probably told a story. And so that you have songs that kind of connect different things. And so there was a, there was a need for different types of writing styles. Mm. When you get to streaming, there's just like a prioritization of one particular writing style, which is hit writing style. Mm. And the only other, like what that did in like how it related to Terraform the landscape was it said, well, there's a whole lot of movies like shows coming out, because still the same type of technology streaming because of streaming. Now you got more shows. You, you are not limited by the amount of programming hours in a day. You got more than 24 hours. You got like unlimited time. You can create way more shows and you can reach way more people again, cause you're not limited by the bandwidth. Mm. So you have so much more content. All of those productions need songs. If they go to try to find the only songs that are being created that are popular hit songs. Well, those songs cost more money mm -hmm. because they're hits. So you've created a demand, actually, you've increased demand for non-hit songs. Mm -hmm. And I think that is really why sync is like this thing, especially post-2020, why mm -hmm. it's like this, like, oh, it's this mega thing and everybody feels like they can get in. And it's like, well, because to some degree, everybody is working on a budget. And they may not be able to afford these very expensive top, like, you know, hits. And they may need writers who do not write hit songs. They write songs that are really good songs. Yeah. Songs that really fit, like, the emotion of what is going on. And that, I think that's, like, a resurgence mm -hmm. of the non-hit song writer where there was, like, a hole in the market for a little while because of that dip. Mm. And, it, and, and to just kind of... Um reference that as well with uh pink floyd uh i just heard like you know there was something you know they were talking about dark side of the moon there's an anniversary of, of its release and <clears throat> sorry how how okay. so many so many of of the songs on that record which is a seminal one you know one of the biggest albums of all time that were never singles you know right songs on that record that now you know sean know you're crazy diamond like all all of these songs that you that we know that never came out as a, a single per se but that have kind of had their own life um outside of that and if you know if we'd want to like where would a dark side of the moon fit in today it would only fit in really for sync Right. You know, uh, because in general, people, you know, streaming is such a singles um, oriented uh, kind of uh, broad or, or medium um, that it's it's hard to kind of break through with those kind of records, I think. Yeah. And, I, you know, I think that you like that it touches on such a you're touching on such a great and insightful piece of information which is how important it is 
to surveil the landscape to understand what like the market looks like what your skill sets are like you know what the thing that you can plant on that terrain is and where you should be Mm. you know if you're looking at a like a let's say you're looking at this beautiful valley or something and there's some mountains over here some hills and there's some flat land over there there's the river on that side you know and this this, i'm just trying to paint the scene maybe there's some trees in the back and you it's like well what do you have well it's like look i have wheat you know and and what do you have well maybe you have corn and you know maybe somebody else had you know it's kind of like okay well we all need to plant in different areas this is an entire landscape but we all have different things that may go different places we can plant in different areas Mm. and then maybe when i need the other thing i come to you and i say hey what do you have over there in your area can we do some exchanging what you know and i I just think that we have for for the sake of the analogy you know i think that we have a lot of writers who are and artists who are attempting to plant the wrong thing in the wrong soil Mm-hmm. you know it's really like what do yeah. you have yeah, yeah, okay that I, should probably go over there <laughs> like, yeah and I, I that's why i i also um would probably like m- when i work with songwriters and artists and artists in particular um i always kind of one of the most important things is, is for me is to find help the artist find out who they are mm-hmm. because a lot of artists are not sure who they are and i understand why that is because there's so much coming at them like oh you should be like this you should be you know posting cover covers on TikTok and instagram and and you know do this and do that but you know it's not for every artist is that you know it's about being authentic what you know what is the authentic thing for them because i think it shines through in the end uh for whoever like sees it when it's it doesn't feel authentic in the, uh, to them i mean there, there's an artist that is blowing up over here right now and i think she's gonna do well in in the states uh she's also a great writer she's written a lot for other people and featured on other records her name is ray r-a-y-e and she was on a, a major label for uh almost 10 years I think she she got signed as a young teenager like I think she was like 15 or or something like that and um they would never really let her kind of like release her album like she would be a featured singer here featured singer there she did a lot of dance records she sung with David Guetta and all these big DJs and and she she co-wrote those songs she's a really good writer and but what she wanted to do for herself that never materialized and finally she went on twitter and she she kind of just let it all out that she was so frustrated this is she told you know the public you know her frustration with the label and this was then reported in all the papers as well so the label actually did let her go and she last year like at the end of last year she uh released her first couple of singles and it's so she she went number one with her first single i think it was and it's so good and it's basically a a, you know it's so authentic and it's so about her life and and her trials and tribulations to to this point and uh the album just came out and it's really really good and and it's a, I think it's it's really kind of resonated with people because she find I mean her previous records did well as well but I think this kind of really resonated it feels like it's really her as a writer because what you just said Dude. just touched me I'm, <laughs> sorry I'm so sorry. final question final question this will be uh good information I didn't realize that we had been talking for so long when what advice would you give to a writer who wants to write for artists and wants to be able to to find that or bring that out of the artist? Maybe they're working with an artist who doesn't have their identity down, 
But like, how can a writer kind of go in, sit with an artist and pull that out and craft something that this person will be like, wow, I didn't know that this was my identity. And now I must work with you because you get me. Mm. I always have, have a talk, like a, a long talk at the beginning of, of every session about what's going on in that artist's life. I, I will, I mean, I, I will get a playlist of their favorites, but a lot of the time an artist's playlist is not, is not necessarily what they're going to sound like at all. Um, and I think you just have to write a lot, you know, you just have to write and always think just because that day's song is not like you know, the, the masterpiece that you want to make doesn't mean that it's not important in the way that to get to where, where you want to go. The more you write, the better you get. Writing is a muscle. And uh, you will get, if you work with that artist, you will get, there will be that day, maybe when they're like, you know, had their heart broken or something. And, and, you come up with with that one line that kind of opens the tap of it all, and you will you will know when that when it just feels authentic, you know. But you you do have to kind of be still and kind of feel and listen and not not um, you have to be open. I mean, it's a whole kind of I know it's it sounds a little airy fairy, but but. Uh, it, it's, you know, I've, I've been there, I've, I've felt it, and I think, and the artists have felt it, and it's, you know, it's just, then it's all, that makes it all worth it, the way, the way there, I think. Um, no, I, I think you're absolutely, I don't think anything about what you just said felt, quote unquote, airy fairy, <laughs> you know, I, I think it would benefit anyone who gets to listen to this episode and gets to listen to all of the insight that you were sharing. Thank you. If they are open to the things that were discussed in here um, and the things that you said and glean from your wisdom and your experience, I think that they will very much understand that what you just said was not airy fairy. <laughs> <laughs> good. Good. I, I like helping people. Yeah. I like like people helping people achieve their their potential. So, and I like to hear more great music. So, as a music fan, it's a it's, you know, I it happened. It just happened to me the other day. We listened to a new artist, and and ah, oh, it was so good. She finally kind of like found that that song that that kind of. So, do you take any unsolicited music? If I take, Do you take any unsolicited music? music, like if someone was listening and they're like, oh, like I'd, how would someone be able to get in contact with you? Are you open to that? I am, but time is kind of also, I think if, if somebody that the one thing, and I would say this to anybody, not just if they contact me, but I would say just send one song. Like I'm not, if somebody has a playlist with five songs, I'm, you know, I know uh, artists that say that thing or songwriters that think, okay, well, if they don't like the first song, I might like the second or the third song. If I don't like the first song, I'm probably not going to listen to the second song either. I know that sounds terrible, but you know, it's like, I, you know, we all time is that, as you were saying that the one thing that is limited for for every human being is time. Time is the commodity, Sorry. and uh, I love discovering new music. So I will. Uh, I mean, I I judge. Um, I've been on the jury for the Ivan Novello Awards, um, and we. I will always listen. Like with all those things, I would listen to a verse, bridge, chorus uh, of each song at least. You know, because we listen through like hundreds of songs. So, so I would put sure links. We have a really good first verse in it, you know, first verse, bridge and chorus. 
<laughs> right, because after that, Hellyann not listening no more. <laughs> she said, "Nah, cut off. I'm not listening anymore. I'm gonna put like you know your Instagram handle or you know Twitter, whatever, yeah, yeah. wherever you tell me you want to provide. I'll put it in the show notes so that people will have a way to just sh- express their love or follow you or you know check out an article that you write or s- follow you along your journey and being an advocate." for helping songwriters get paid what they deserve to get paid and and getting our recognition recognized the way that it should be. Thank you. I, I also want to say thank you. I want to say thank you for coming on this episode. Thank you for everything that you do in terms of like moving our career forward. If no one is telling you that enough, I want to tell you here now. Thank you for that. It's very valuable. It's appreciated. This is how I make my living, and it's very important to me. And to know that there is someone else out there fighting that battle, it it matters. So thank you. And I actually, I think it's important that every songwriter and, and composer kind of uh, get gets on board as well. I mean, a lot of the time we will do work, but we like, you know, we need people to sign petitions or things like that you know it's always good to get people involved and and you know with, with the um pay songwriters thing that more and more people ask for points and and for for uh per diems because the more we do it i always say producers didn't use to get paid up front either or get points on the oh, it gets points on the master they they didn't get points on the master but they were, you know, I mean, George Martin didn't get points on, on the Beatles masters, but now if you're a producer, you will get points you on do. the master. So, you know, it, it's just, you know, it's, it's about that people, you know, uh, value what you do and, and, uh, you know, uh, reward you accordingly. And the more people do that, then, then it will help everybody. Well, thank you so much for being on. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Kevin. It's good to see you. (laughs) 